Louise, is this okay? Yep. Right here? And I'm supposed to take off this so that the mic works and properly? And the shirt. <laughs> For you. <laughs> and is this on? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, first of all, before I start, this is, I'm always trying to expand the minutes. Um, the, um, before I start, um, I wanted to say two things. One is that the articles in your binder, uh, I want to highly recommend to you. Um, uh, Mark and Laura Gray have, have assembled some really excellent material for you to read that, that I think you will find extremely interesting. Uh, and, and then I've, I've got one article in there for the last talk uh, by Adrienne Rich, and she is so sharp um, that I think you'll really enjoy her voice as well and her being in um, the homestead in the bedroom. Excuse me, I, I know you want to maintain your sartorial splendor since you're on camera, but your collar is up. I know it's the other side. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Sartorial splendor. Once uh, President Wilson was walking the colonnade and saw me, uh, this was back in the old days, I was smoking a cigarette and had a camo chamois shirt on. And he said, Professor Warren, I'm so glad you're upholding the sartorial standards of the college. Uh, and, and I said, President Wilson, somebody's got to do it. Uh, so let's, let's go. Um, I think one of the interesting things uh, to begin with about these two poets of the neighborhood is, first of all, how very different their careers uh, were. I think Emily Dickinson is probably most famous for not being famous, um, while Robert Frost is, uh, from my background at least, the most well-known and most celebrated of America's many poets. But despite this huge gap or difference in their careers, I think the two of them are very much alike in being devoted to their local neighborhoods and very much alike in their devotion to their vocation, the calling of being a poet. Um, and then last but not least, they are also very much alike in being subject to legends and myths about who they were as people and who they were as poets. And I've suffered in my education from those myths, uh, being, being uh, taught them and believing them. So even though Dickinson was never known in her own lifetime as a poet, really, she was completely and utterly dedicated to her poetry and saw herself as a poet. She saw herself as a writer whose business was poetry. That doesn't mean that she sought fame and renown. She was always very wary of publication and publicity. And we can see both the seriousness of her dedication and her real hesitation at making her poetry known to the public in a letter that she wrote to um, an editor at the Atlantic Monthly, a man named Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Uh, Higginson was a very well-known writer in that time, and she wrote him in April 1862. Um, and he was, uh, he was an associate editor at the Atlantic Monthly, which was the literary magazine of the day. He had written this article called um, Letter to a Young Contributor, and it had been published in the April 1862 issue of The Atlantic. And Dickinson read that article at home. Her father, as she said, I live in my father's house, and she, uh, her father took the magazine, had a subscription to the magazine. Um, and she decided that Higginson uh, might be trustworthy as a reader of her poems. And so in, on 15 April, she sent him a letter and enclosed four poems, a um, card in an envelope with her name on it, and a letter. And the letter reads as follows. Here it goes. Mr. Higginson, 
Are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? The mind is so near itself, it cannot see distinctly, and I have none to ask. Should you think it breathed, and had you the leisure to tell me, I should feel quick gratitude. If I make a mistake, that you dare to tell me would give me sincerer honor toward you. I enclosed my name, asking you, if you please, sir, to tell me what is true. That you will not betray me, it is needless to ask, since honor is its own pawn. Now, how would you like to get a letter like that? <laughs> of course. T.W. Higginson responded immediately and wrote her back and said about her poetry that she should wait to publish and try to make her poetry more regular and accessible. <laughs> and some of you may think, yeah. <laughs> and over time, they, they uh, were correspondents for decades. And uh, she, he meant a lot to her. But over time and, and in our modern day, many critics have criticized uh, Higginson for preventing Dickinson from becoming a real public poet. Um, but I think Higginson may have had the right idea about her uh, at that time and her poems. Um, maybe they are poems of the mind so near itself. These are poems that are private and interior. Uh, maybe they are not meant to be read in the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, we don't want to see a poem of hers on page 46 of the New Yorker. Um, and I think we could really appreciate Higginson's response because of Dickinson's letter to him and the tone that she takes toward him. Uh, she asks him for advice about her poems, but she also portrays herself as alone, none to ask about her work. She asks to remain anonymous. She asks him not to betray her. And she uses that word honor twice in the letter, as if this is some kind of risky communication on the edge of propriety. She is trusting in his honor as a gentleman, and she means to be clear to him that she is a lady, as we might have said at the time. But at the same time, this letter is asking not, uh, how about the rhymes? Uh, how, how do you like my meters? No, she's asking for big advice. Are my poems alive? Do my poems breathe? Are they true? Not, how about those slant rhymes? <laughs> she has an immense conception of what a poem is supposed to do and be. So overall, this letter suggests to me that in 1862, April of 1862, Emily Dickinson has an incredibly strong sense of vocation, of calling, even if she has, as she says, none to ask about her work. Just two months later, in July of 1862, she writes him again. He has written her back, and she responds to him, sends him six more poems, and says, she is going to try to obey his editorial recommendations gratefully, um, as if she were some kind of novice or student to this mentor. And then she says, here are six more. I hope you will not laugh at me. And then she says, perhaps you smile at me. I could not stop for that. My business is circumference. My business is circumference. Let that sentence, write that one down. That is a statement by Emily Dickinson of her vocation as a poet. 
and what poetry is supposed to accomplish to reach all the way around the circumference, to enclose the world of emotions and ideas. So let's take these two letters to Higginson as two different attitudes toward her own writing, first acting as a shy young student writer, unsure of herself and her work, but in July, only two months later, totally confident, bold in her tone. My business is circumference. What's yours? So, what about this Emily Dickinson and the legend of Emily Dickinson? An unmarried daughter who never left her father's home in Amherst, Massachusetts. Yes, she ventured off for a year of schooling when she was 16. She studied at the Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, eventually to become Mount Holyoke College. In 1864 and then again in 1865, she had to travel to Boston for extended stays. She had a painful eye condition, uh, which was causing her not to be able to see clearly. Uh, they, they now think it was what we call iritis, an inflammation of the iris. Um, she was under a doctor's care for eight months in 64 and again for six months in 65. She was told, do not write uh, with pen, use pencil only. Um, she stayed with two of her cousins, Francis and Louisa Norcross, who became extremely close to her. Those were her last trips out of Amherst, one year as a 16-year-old and then two times to Boston. She returned in 1865, rarely ventured off the grounds of her home at the homestead. She was 35 years old. For those of you who are wondering what your 39-year-old is going to do, Think about that. She is famously, legendarily a recluse. But the other part of this is Emily Dickinson maintained a lot of literary friendships and family relationships with a host of people, mainly through a really voluminous correspondence. She wrote letters and letters and letters, many letters a day. The Norcross cousins, these two uh, younger cousins, Francis and Louisa, were one set of readers. Her sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert Dickinson, who lived right next door, received nearly 300 letters. They call it the, the communication over the hedge. These two women lived next door to one another and were very, very close. Probably when she said she had no one to ask, that was wrong because she had Susan and had been asking her for advice and criticism and was getting it. Susan Gilbert Dickinson was an incredibly intelligent reader. She would send correspondence dozens of her poems, often with variant spellings and wording and emphasis. So for those of you who are worried about uh, grammar and, and spelling, well, you should read some of her correspondence. She does the IT apostrophe S, and you know, that's just the way it is. So she used these correspondence as a sounding board and a potential audience. She lived from 1830 to 1886. She lived through some of the most turbulent and convulsive years of American history, for sure. And often we may think she's separate from the great events of her lifetime, like the Civil War, <laughs> for example. But it is no accident that her most prolific years, if you look in the book and see when she's writing all the poems, 1861 to 1865. Mm -hmm. Higginson certainly helped her with her poetry, but so did these terrible years of the Civil War. Yes, perhaps her poetry is less directly marked by history. You do find her writing about battles 
and particular battles, for example, Antietam comes up in her, in her writing. Um, but uh, even if it doesn't uh, show direct marking uh, and does not seem to engage these large issues like African American slavery, her poetry does participate in the social world of 19th century America. It does engage a lot of these issues, but as we were saying, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. She's always moving it in direction, not direct confrontation. And then perhaps most important about her is her influence on 20th century and 21st century American poets um, and writers. Um, and this is something that has happened in my lifetime, um, that she, she, people like Adrienne Rich are responsible for this as we'll see on the last day. So all of this said, I want, to, I want to emphasize this fact that Dickinson is really a constant surprise. Uh, she died on 15 May, 1886. Her dearly, dearly loved sister, Lavinia, or Vinnie, went into her bedroom and found a treasure trove of poems. There were 40 sewn packets of poems, piles of worksheets, scraps of paper, pieces of envelopes with lines and images on them. These sewn packets, 40 of them, are um, now called fascicles. That's in your outline if you need the spelling. Uh, it's a printer's term for a partial set of material intended for publication. Um, but if those fascicles of hers, 40 of them, were intended for a publication, it's really a form of private publication. Um, maybe they functioned in a way as a record, a clear, a clear and clean set of texts for her to see. And she often made copies from those fascicles and from those clean copies. So, as you know, since I know that you did your homework that I asked you to do and you read R.W. Franklin's intro, um, he tells us in that intro that um, in these earliest bundles or fascicles, she's creating clean copies and probably destroying the, the drafts. And that's sort of what she was doing in the early years. But then around 1861 or so, she started including variants. Uh, she would put like a little cross uh, or an X on a word in the poem, in the clean copy, and then at the, at the bottom she would put a variant reading. Uh, she would send different versions of one poem to different friends. And uh, Susan Gilbert was one of the ones who would say to her, let's rewrite this uh, safe in their alabaster chambers. That last stanza is too sentimental. And she would rewrite it. And then she would send it to Sue and say, Dear Sue, is this frostier? <laughs> um, so she could whip out a fresh stanza in nothing flat. These 40 fascicles that Vinnie found contain something like 800 poems, so about 20 per fascicle. And they, uh, Franklin thinks they date from 1860 to 64. Uh, this is by handwriting. Uh, and then she, just to real quickly do this, she ordered other poems in groupings that Franklin calls sets. They're not bound uh, by string, but they're clean copies. So by 1865, Emily Dickinson had something close to 1,100 poems in hand. After 1865, her production declines but she continues to write, and if you see her chronology of the years, she has moments where, years where she comes back and writes 40, 50 poems in a year. Uh, some of us would be really happy with that, if we could do that. Uh, our edition, which is the, the cleanest and latest, there are, the reason that we have different numbering is there, there was a, an earlier edition that Mark and I grew up with, um, and uh, the little brown. And uh, this one, though, is the one uh, for now, for us. Um, 
So, yeah, 1,800 poems, roughly. If uh, Charlie Hart has his way, there will be more. Uh, but uh, no, no further comment on Charlie Hart. Uh, magnificent seven. I can tell you this, that in my teaching at Washington and Lee, I, I went from uh, teaching sort of thematics uh, and, and just reading a lot of the poems, trying to get students to read a hundred poems for each meeting, uh, that kind of thing, and you know, they hated me. Um, I, would, I then turned to trying to teach the fascicles, and uh, that was fascinating as a way of, of trying to come to some sort of coherent strategy about the reading. And some of those fascicles do seem to um, have 20 poems that are related to one another one way or another. It's a little difficult to say exactly how. Maybe thematically you might find some things that hold them together. Some readers will find a, a sense of development in a fascicle um, as if there's a, a quasi-narrative going on, um, a plot. Others have tried to find some sort of stylistic coherence to the gatherings within a fascicle. And um, I, I tend to think of them as collections, uh, little collections of, or clusters of poems. And they are as surprising and puzzling as every poem she writes. Uh, I have yet to come up with a way to uh, really come to a clear understanding of what the 40 fascicles are about. There are other ways to think about her vocation as a, as a poet and how she took the local, the ordinary, and made it extraordinary. Um, and like a lot of writers, she has a handful of themes that she returns to again and again and again. Um, and that is not a limitation, it's a deepening all the time. So for example, and most particularly for us, there are many, many poems that deal with the natural surroundings of Amherst to uh, deal with the plants and animals that she encounters on her walks and the views that she finds in the hills around her, the thoughts that these, these natural surroundings give her or prompt in her. And we're going to hear from my really wonderful friends uh, much more about some of these things, that is poems of perception of exaltation, poems of doubt, deep doubt. She loves the birds. She loves some of them so deeply. That's what I love about her. She loves the flowers and the plants, cultivated and wild. She was one hell of a gardener. So that's one set of themes. Another is religion or spirituality. Gosh, she had a hard time as a religious person. Uh, she questions her own beliefs and struggles with them all the time. When she was a teenager at Mount Holyoke for that year at age 16, there was the first of many religious revivals in the Connecticut River Valley. And a revival swept the female seminary at Mount Holyoke. And she was one of the few who was not able to accept Jesus Christ as her personal savior. She could not. It gives me chills to say that. She could not. 16. There were many of these religious revivals. Um, some people uh, think of it as a, an awakening and uh, in the 1840s and 50s. Never able to convert. She wrote to a close friend of hers, Abaya Root, in January 1846 and said, I continually hear Christ saying to me, Daughter, give me thine heart. And she cannot say yes. She says others around her melt, her word, melt. She cannot melt. In her young adulthood, at least one more time, she felt the call to convert, and she said to herself, and I'm quoting her again, I am not a Christian. Still, I feel deeply the importance of attending to the subject before it is too late. My God! 
This experience of belief and doubt appears and reappears in her poems. Related themes, time, mortality, the experience of dying, dying without being able to say, Jesus, thank you for being my personal savior. Wow. No, not able. And then Rob pre-loaded this one for me. What a poet of love and sexuality. The nun of Amherst? Huh. She adopts a host of tones and stances in these love poems. Oh yes, let's have her exulting in the white heat of love. Whew. And then she can adopt this heartbreaking tone of distance from a lover, of the inability to be with that lover, ever. Uh, many readers have wondered if she was in love with Sue, Susan Gilbert Dickinson, her sister-in-law. Okay? Somebody with that imagination? Yeah, okay. I'm in love with Jim. <laughs> As Rob alluded, uh, many candidates for her beloved appear in these men that were of her acquaintance. And one of them, maybe one, was the so-called master to whom she wrote uh, three and possibly more letters and a lot of poems that address a master. And people claim it might be Charles Wadsworth. People claim this person, that person. We actually do not know. We don't even know if she sent the letters, you know, some fair copy of the letters to whoever, whomever it may be. Some people doubt that she was even a, a physical being and that a lot of this was in her head, in her imagination. Um, but I do want to say this, and this is total legend and rumor and hearsay. But I was told as a youth that Vinnie came into the parlor one day in the 1870s, and Emily was sitting in Judge Otis Lord's lap. <laughs> he was a lover of hers late in life, and they have quite a correspondence, a love correspondence. And he was a neighbor in the neighborhood, and they didn't get together much. They had an intimate, loving relationship as mature people. I think she writes most persuasively as an adult, mature woman. And for me, the most compelling and interesting of her poems combine these themes in surprising ways. For me, a poem is great when I'm reading it and it seems to be about a lover, and then it turns into a poem about God when sensual love turns into spiritual love, or the reverse. When a poem seems to be about a tree or a flower and it becomes a sorrowful lament for lost love or lost faith or lost life. In 466, if you can turn to that, if you've got it here, check it out. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose. Yeah, her poetry is a poetry of possibility. Possibilities of meaning, of tones, of experiences, of emotions. And these possibilities of poetry run in multiple directions at the same moment. That's why when you're reading her, you'll say, hey, hold it. I got to the next stanza and now I have to go back. She's going, her syntax is moving in two directions at once. Yes, that's exactly right. Look at that poem. The spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Circumference, circumference. My business is circumference. It's also the case that a single poem with a single topic provides rich experiences for us as readers. And I want us to go to 446 and I want to read it aloud and 
talk about it just a bit. 446. This was a poet. It is that distills amazing sense from ordinary meanings and attar so immense from the familiar species that perished by the door. We wonder it was not ourselves arrested it before. Of pictures the discloser, the poet, it is he entitles us by contrast to ceaseless poverty. Of portion, so unconscious, the robbing could not harm, himself to him a fortune, exterior to time. Well, there are many possibilities for understanding this poem, but one thing that we can agree upon immediately is she is describing the power of the poet in the world. And the poet, the power of this poet is to distill amazing sense from ordinary meanings, to create an attar so immense from the familiar species that perish by the door. The poet acts as a distiller, and I have the feeling that the Magnificent Seven of 67 may have a thought about distilleries. <laughs> the familiar species she refers to are likely flowers. I'm sure Laura Gray would go with me on that. They're plants that might, familiar plants that would grow right next to your door when you walk out. And they live and die there. Ordinary, familiar, common. But the poet distills those flowers into an essence, an essential oil or perfume, perfume called an attar. What a great word, an attar. And that attar is much more than ordinary. By distilling the ordinary into this essence, the attar becomes amazing sense. The distillation of ordinary meanings into the extraordinary significance of a poem. This is a magnificent, concise portrait of the poet, of the transformative power of writing about the familiar things in the neighborhood. And it is only the first movement of this poem. This is only the first half. In the second half, Dickinson contrasts the poet with us. We seem to be us ordinary readers. Yeah? The poet makes us wonder, why, why is it we cannot distill amazing sense ourselves from ordinary meanings. What's wrong? What's up with that? As students of mine used to say. Why is it that we can't somehow arrest the attar, distill the attar into beautiful poetry? Damn it, the poet seems so rich, so regal, so powerful. And by contrast, we ordinary readers, we ordinary mortals, all we get is ceaseless poverty. And the act of reading a poem by someone like this is an act of thievery, of robbery. We rob the wealthy poet of her riches, the attar so immense. But the poet is so unconscious of this wealth, she is so unconscious of her imaginative portion, that when we rob her, she doesn't even realize it. It's like my twin brother used to say about my parents. They have, too much, they have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. So he used a lot of it. <laughs> Her imagination remains intact even after our thievery. The for, and she is given a fortune exterior to time. I think also that Poem 446 is very clever about gender. In Dickinson's hands, note that the poet is a male figure. The poet, it is he. Who is the speaker in this poem? Uh, the speaker is identified with this plural, we and us. We are the readers of the poem. And it could be that we could translate the first line, uh, this was a poet, as something like this. This is a poem. 
The poem contains the imagination of the poet. It expresses that imagination. It presses the attar out of the familiar species and gets that essential oil, that perfume. Those familiar species all die and then they live again constantly turning and changing through their seasons of time and mortality. Those seasons I'm going to talk about in another talk. And by identifying this poet as male, Dickinson adopts a humble, modest role. The same role that I like to adopt as a reader myself, to be honest. I, I hesitate as a reader to talk about my feelings in a poem. I'm always worshiping the poet. I just can't help myself. I, that's a confession. She joins us as audience, as readers, but we also know that she wrote this poem. <laughs> you know, she created that imagery. She created the rhymes and the slant rhymes, the meters and the rhythms. As, as if a womanly speaker is a nearly invisible figure in this poem. And yet that invisible figure exerts great power. It is that invisible figure who keeps this whole poem in powerful, perpetual motion. That is the business of circumference. Well, at first glance, you turn to Robert Frost and say, Surely this career is exactly the opposite of Dickinson. After all, this man was awarded four Pulitzer Prizes for poetry in his lifetime. Four. I, have, I actually have friends who have won a Pulitzer Prize, one in uh, composition of music and one in poetry. Sharon Olds is a friend. And to win one changes your life. You become a famous person, a celebrity person, and the doors open everywhere. Think about four. It's incredible, really. He became a kind of unofficial poet laureate of the uh, country after World War II, uh, before we even had poet laureates. And then legendarily, famously, he recited by memory the gift outright at JFK's inauguration in 61, and all of us, when my generation, and, and for those of you in my generation, largely, uh, I'm not sure about the youngins, but, but the, for those of us who are a little longer in the tooth, uh, we read Frost early on, uh, grade school, middle school, high school, all the way through public school, we read Frost time and time again. Poems like The Road Not Taken or Stopping by Woods on a snowy evening. We can even just say Stopping by Woods and we all know what we're talking about. They have been memorized so often that many of our generations can recite them by heart. Even those of us who can't really remember our daughter-in-law's name. Or <laughs> but Frost did not start out as America's poet. And that role really came to him late in life after all the Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, like Dickinson, he came to poetry very early in life and he dedicated himself to the vocation of being a poet, absolutely. But he was not a success in his youth or early adulthood. He was 40 years old, married with several children struggling to make a living raising poultry on a farm in New Hampshire and teaching school on the side to make ends meet like a lot of farmers have to do. And he had not published a single book of poems at age 40. Magazines in America constantly rejecting his work over and over and over again, 40 years old barely making a living, dedicated to his writing, writing and writing and writing. So in 1912, he decided to sell the farm and move to England. New England, goodbye. 
Old England, here I come. And he picks up and takes his whole family over to England. And it turned out this move was an incredibly smart one. He got to England and met British poets like Edward Thomas and Robert Graves and became very close friends with them. And I think most importantly, he became friends with the expatriate American poet Ezra Pound. And Pound was a, a accomplished writer himself, but he was also a movement maker and an impresario of others. And he took Frost on and said, we're going to make you into a public, published poet. In short order, Pound helped Frost publish two books, the first two books, A Boy's Will and North of Boston in England. And he got them reviewed in America and favorably. He made sure they were favorable reviews. He helped him uh, get the American editions of those first two books published in 1914 by Henry Holt Company. And so when World War I broke out in 1914, the Frost family returned to America the following year in 1915. Robert Frost was well known in America. In 1916, he brought out his third book, Mountain Interval, and that solidified his reputation. Now the magazines were taking his work. His fourth book, New Hampshire, 1923, first Pulitzer Prize. And I can tell you, to win that, that changed his life. After 1923, he wins three more Pulitzer Prizes for collected poems in 1930 and the collections of Further Range in 36 and the wit a Witness Tree in 1942. So all of his prize-winning work is up to 1942. So let's say 1914 to 1942 is the real work that he's getting done. And he became this public figure, this public poet. Now as Mark Long, our farmer, writer, scholar, poet, person here, knows Frost kept trying to farm. Uh, he farmed in Franconia, New Hampshire. He farmed in Ripton, Vermont. But the real truth is, ultimately, he didn't make his living as a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, and he sure didn't make his living as a chicken farmer. Uh, he made his living as a teacher, and he was a great teacher. He taught part-time for several years at Amherst College. He taught at the University of Michigan. He was the poet in residence, honored at Harvard, at Dartmouth, at Amherst. For 42 years, from 1921 to 1962, Robert Frost taught every summer at the Breadloaf School of English for Middlebury College in Ripton. And the college now owns and maintains his farmstead near the Breadloaf campus in Ripton. I visited the one, somebody else was telling me this this morning, I think, maybe one of the 67, uh, that um, uh, in Franconia you can also visit his farm. Um, I've done that one, made it to that one. I think Frost is actually more traditional in style than Dickinson that in a way Emily Dickinson is more modern than, than Frost. Frost is a master of rhyme and meter, so much so that some of his contemporaries thought he was not modern enough. And yet he, as Seamus Heaney was saying uh, yesterday when I mentioned this sentence by Heaney that he realizes now that Frost is a literary poet, but he gives the world as it is its say. Well, he marries his traditional mastery with a wonderful ear for colloquial speech. And many of these New England poems feature rural characters, the labor of farm and field and woods, hard lives led in lonesome places. Often the speaker comes across as a wise, somewhat skeptical observer, nobody's fool. 
And for many readers in my generation, we think of Frost, we thought of Frost, as this kindly old man, 86 years old, almost as old as the president. <laughs> Get it? I'm joking. <laughs> uh, 86 years old, standing in the cold sunlight in Washington, D.C. at Kennedy's inauguration. And because the glare of that winter uh, sun, probably oppressing him like cathedral tunes, he could not see the text of the poem he had written. And so he recited a gift outright. It's a mythic moment of this old man, this kindly old rustic thrust upon the national stage. Yeah, I was seven, you know, not quite seven. These are benign views. And the idea that he was some kind of nostalgic traditionalist, uh, some rural farmer writing these poems, th these, these views have changed a lot uh, during my life as a teacher of Frost's work. The biography of the poet and most lately his letters, they, they reveal a life of depression, loss, grief, terrible losses. Both of his parents died early. His father died when Frost was 11. His father left the family $8. Lately, I've been wondering if I'll leave my wife that much. <laughs> Frost and his wife, Eleanor, were high school sweethearts. They had six children. Only two of them outlived their father. Two died in infancy. His only son committed suicide. Another daughter died when she was 30 years old, giving birth. Eleanor suffered from depression, constant. Eleanor died of heart failure after she had fought breast cancer for over a year. She was 65. Frost would live another 25 years as a widower, kindly old man. Critics and readers have come to see Frost's poems as dark, much more modern than they first seem. Those rural characters, for example, they're not all fun and games, you know. It ain't Green Acres, for those of you who know what I'm saying. <laughs> Some of you, uh, Susie, you have no idea what I was just saying. <laughs> they seem to have a lot more in common with Flannery O'Connor's good country people mm -hmm. than they do with Norman Rockwell's Americana. Yeah, Frost is given to humor, grim, black humor. The wry laugh at a world, a world without inherent meaning. Maybe his New England is most like the rural Ontario that we discover in Alice Munro's short stories, if you've ever read Alice Munro. Grew up in rural Ontario, Nobel Prize winner herself. Beautiful stories, yes. And then what? Readers have discovered that they have been mistaken in this Robert Frost. I'm alluding to Herman Melville in that sentence. Herman Melville said the same thing about Nathaniel Hawthorne. For many of his readers, Hawthorne was a pleasant writer with a pleasant style. A writer who, Melville wrote, means no meanings. But, said Melville, in one word, this world is mistaken in this Nathaniel Hawthorne. He himself must have often smiled at its absurd misconceptions of him. He is immeasurably deeper than the plummet of the mere critic. It is not the brain that can test such a man. It is only the heart. You cannot come to know greatness by inspecting it. There is no glimpse to be caught of it except by intuition. You need not ring it, you but touch it, and you find it is gold. So too, Robert Frost. If you are reading him and you say to yourself, I get it, but I don't really know how to say what this poem means, that's right. That's right. You but touch it, and it is gold. 
the grim and dark side comes through clearly in these longer poems of North of Boston. I love a lot of these poems. These poems are written in unrhymed iambic pentameter, that is blank verse, we call it, blank verse, unrhymed iambic pentameter. And this is the form used by Milton in Paradise Lost. It's the form used by Shakespeare in his great tragedies and histories. It is the form used by Wordsworth in The Prelude. It is a form of great dignity, a form that can uh, give us narrative as well as meditation. Um, it's a form that is very flexible. It can approach the rhythms of speech and yet stay within the formal constraints of a dignified iambic pentameter metrics. And he uses uh, blank verse in poems like The Death of the Hired Man and Home Burial. And these poems extend beyond 100 lines, so I'm not even going to try to read any of this right now. They employ a rural setting in New England. They focus on country characters who lead a hard scrabble life without much income. Their lives reach beyond their circumstances in the ways that Frost treats them. Look at, uh, for example, the death of the hired man. I'm looking around page 38 now. In this poem, the couple Mary and Warren are talking about their hired man, Silas, who has returned from some long travels. Perhaps he has returned to help Warren ditch the meadow. That's their idea. Or has Silas returned simply to die because this farm is all he knows as home? Mary thinks Silas has, and here she's speaking, that Silas has come home to die you needn't be afraid he'll leave you this time. And Warren responds by mocking her gently and repeating the word home. And then this, yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course he's nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods, worn out upon the trail. This is probably Warren speaking. Home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And then Mary's response, I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. The meaning of the hired man's life and his return to this farm lies in that conversation, the meaning of home. And that meaning lies not in any one definition, but in the way that Warren and Mary talk to one another. Silas never appears in this poem, but in the dialogue of the husband and wife, in that conversation that creates him and brings him home into this many-sided definition of home, we know that they are his home. They have to take him in. He doesn't have to deserve to be taken in. That is how we know that Silas is home. I get chills saying all that. No home is perfect. Silas dies lying behind the wood stove, alone, while his employers are wondering, what has brought him back here? What has brought him home? And then look at page 51 at Home Burial, another dialogue poem in blank verse with a dramatic, violent, potentially violent scene. And in that poem, the couple are trying to negotiate their way. There are different ways of grieving for their lost child. And when we read this poem, we may find ourselves choosing a side in the fight. I always have found myself, unfortunately, choosing a side. Do we choose according to our gender? That's usually the way. Is that why what is finally buried here? The possibility of men and women speaking some common language and understanding one another? Is that what we lose here? Is the impossibility of understanding one's partner fully and sympathetically buried here? The loss leaves no love behind. For me, home burial makes me shudder, a terrible shudder. And I want to say it this way, y'all, a shudder of self-recognition. I have been there. 
Many of us have been there. Frost's poems feature labor. And in a lot of cases, it's the labor of understanding one another, the labor of loving one another, the labor of living with one another, of being in the neighborhood. A lot of the time, when he's meditating on labor, he's also meditating on the work of poetry itself. So that for me, a poem like After Apple Picking, I, I don't really have time, I'm almost out of time, but, hmm? 15 minutes. Really, you're gonna give me that much time? In this case. So you're gonna let me read After Apple Picking? I love it. Okay. That's on page 68, 69. It seems to reach beyond this apparent subject. Let me just read it aloud and then I'll start. My long two-pointed ladder sticking through a tree toward heaven still. And there's a barrel that I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two or three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I am done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night the scent of apples. I am drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight I got from looking through a pane of glass I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted and I let it fall and break. But I was well upon my way to sleep before it fell and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load on load of apples coming in for I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. There were 10,000 thousand fruit to touch, cherish in hand, lift down and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. <laughs> the speaker is done with apple picking now, and in this aftermath of this great labor, he's drowsing off to sleep. He's in a dreamy mood. He's in a dreamy place. Even his memories of the morning are dreamlike and strange. He's overwhelmed by all this work and all the harvest. He's overtired of the great harvest I myself desired. He thinks of the care he took not to let the apples fall and be bruised, to wind up in the cider apple heap and be seen as of no worth. And in these final lines, these last thoughts of the dreamy speaker, let's hear them one more time real quickly. One can see what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe its coming on, or just some human sleep. Why is this speaker so troubled after such a great harvest? What is troubling the speaker and the sleep that he knows is coming to him? Doesn't he feel a sense of reward? The poem seems to mix the labor of apple picking with the idea of writing poems. After so much labor, for nearly 40 years, Frost has finally had a great harvest in his first two books of poems. And he had certainly tried to cherish the fruits of his labor, not to let them come to be seen as of no worth. But even if we see this as a possible meaning of an imagery in the poem, 
The speaker is not celebrating poetry as the value in the world, the value of beauty, the power of beauty in this world. There is labor and there is the experience of being overtired from the labor. The great harvest does not lead to celebration. It leads simply to sleep. What is that sleep? The speaker is not sure. The sleep will be troubled, probably troubled by the doubts one has as to the value of this great labor and the great harvest. What do the apples matter? What do poems matter? After all, there will be a sleep, whatever sleep it is. Is it the long sleep of hibernation of a woodchuck? Or is it some other sleep, some, just some human sleep, too brief to give us rest and restoration, too brief to allow celebration, too brief to promise anything like resurrection. The sleep and the dream make life seem unreal, fleeting, gone before we can awake to the fact it is gone. Thank you. What else? Do you want to talk? Q&A? That is discussion? Laura. Oh, yes. um, uh, what did, did Emily Dickinson read other poets of the time and prose? Like Elizabeth Barrett Browning was one of her favorites. She also loved Robert Browning. Oh, yeah. As we were pointing out last night, Shakespeare was, she knew Shakespeare backwards and forwards deep. Higginson wrote her early on and said, have you read Walt Whitman? And she said, I have not read Mr. Whitman. I have heard he is, uh, what was the word she scandalous. used? Scandalous? Yeah. I have heard he is scandalous. What about, the, uh, like, was Louisa May Alcott a contemporary been later. of her, or a little later? You know, a little later, but, okay. but a neighbor, okay. you know, in Concord. Okay. Louisa May Alcott's uh, daughter of Bronson Alcott, a, a uh, Concord mass, uh, also buried there. Um, yeah. She loved the Brontes. Oh, that's a good point. Thank you, you are great. Yeah, she loved them. Prose and poetry, yes. Sorry? You get hints of like that mysticism, the romanticism yeah. from the um, I think I think she also, if I remember correctly, she was she was uh, a reader of Keats. Um, that was one of my first loves in poetry. Name any of her poems. Yeah, and and, uh, and it's interesting because when when they after her death they they came out with some uh, bowlerized editions of her poems, and they regularized the punctuation and spelling, and they gave titles, and I mean the titles are excuse the term banal, uh, and. Uh, they, they're like, you know, snow, uh, the hummingbird, you know? And I mean, what the hell? Uh, it's not a hummingbird, it's a root of evanescence, you know? So there's a kind of, you know how it is, Bob, when you, you go into an abstract expressionist uh, uh, exhibition and you say, wow, that's a couple making love, you know? And probably the artist would say, way to go! You know, good, but but it's a literalism, yeah, and a lot of the titles that they gave were just sort of literal titles. It was necessary for publication. Yeah, and they were they were making it obey the standards of the late nineteenth century, the eighteen nineties. It's made it more regular and accessible. More regular and accessible, exactly. I'd like to go back to the influence of Ezra Pound. Okay. Um, 
was uh, James Joyce part of that circle too? And that I mean, pound, the, pound, and it? yes. Now, now here's the thing about Joyce, and I, you know, the person we need here right now, and I'm sure some of you are thinking that as well, is Suzanne Keene. Uh, but, uh, you know, Suzanne, a longtime colleague and friend of mine, and still is a friend of mine, she's now president of Scripps, by the way, out in California. Uh, couldn't, couldn't hire her here. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, Suzanne, expert on Joyce and on Ulysses. Um, so during the same time, Pound is also helping Joyce uh, get up with Shakespeare and Company and get parts of the uh, Ulysses published. And I mean, Pound, you're absolutely right now. He's, he is vital in this period in the 1920s, uh, 19-teens and 20s, in getting this new literature out. Um, and against great resistance because the same kind of impulse of regularizing and accessibilizing and bodlerizing strange writing that made Emily Dickinson's first publications in book form, these, you know, anodyne texts, was also at work in saying, who is this joy? What is he? What's the story? You know? What's going on here? Faulkner, same thing. Who, what, this, this Mississippian doesn't know how to write a straight story, you know? So, yeah, pound, absolutely vital. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, the, the critic, Hugh Kenner, uh, yeah. wrote a book called The Pound Era. So he really was at the center of the literary uh, movements. You know, Frost was a part of this you know, literary modernism in the 20s and 30s. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing, too, is to think of Frost as, you know, the, our myth of him as old country boy. Um, and, uh, of course, that's, that's a nice myth. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of readers now recognize that he's, he's an intense modern writer in a poem like After Apple Picking, there's this loose rhyming that he's using there and varying the line length. And I mean, there's all, that's free verse in a lot of ways that he's working with there. So it's really a modern poem, I think. The, the other thing, I, I, don't, I know you're familiar with this book. No, you don't. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, it was given to me. Yeah. But it, well, I thought it was, he was asked by the Chicago Tribune uh, in 1958, what books have meant the most to him? Mm. Have, have you read No, them? tell me. Uh, and his answer is, number one, the Old Testament. Mm. Number two, the Odyssey by Homer. Mm. Three, the poems of Catalyst. Four, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward mm. Gibbon. Mm. And five, the incidents of travel in Yucatan by John L. Stevens. That that's in this book. <laughs> I thought that was that's crazy. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you make of that? Well, I just I see in especially that the higher man more of a parable, more of a New Testament story, but it comes mm -hmm. from you know the so I then then especially in death of a higher. It just it just seems like a modern day, you know, prodigal son maybe, or mm -hmm. and then the and the fact that he goes home and yeah. his brother or his father is a banker. Yeah, brother. He can't go there. He can't go there. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just. Really it's a good detail. Thank you for that. We all see different things in this book. That's. So, so much depth. Yeah, and I, I can't help but be a little skeptical of Frost, not that I don't believe him about the Old Testament and the Odyssey, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, he's a good liar. Um, I can see the Odyssey. Yeah, I think that he, he, he 
he gave the standard answer, you know, yeah, I revealed Tesla. Yeah. yeah. You know. yeah. And then he throws this curve. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's What's the last hand? one about the yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. I mean, that's oh, good. That's, that's good. Uh, All right, well, thank you, Jim. This is a great yeah. opening. Yeah.